It's not a secret that Hello Neighbor was overhyped for what it was. It had its fair share of bugs, gameplay choices that could drive you insane, convoluted puzzles, and overall poor execution that received negative publicity. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a success, as Tiny Build saw a massive opportunity with the IP, and with the younger fans still supporting it, a franchise was born. And now, there's this. The sequel that did a lot of things right, but made some pretty big promises and, almost like its tradition, had a very rough, controversial launch. After covering the original and with the second game released last year, I think it's about time that we see what went wrong with Hello Neighbor 2. And apparently, quite a lot went wrong. As always, I'm Wicked Wiz, being a man of my word and standing in another fridge. With a short announcement, it's finally happened. The one thing that nobody asked for. YouTuber merch. That's right, we finally have a limited edition plush. The perfect jar filler. The fluffiest beard. Who was even touched by Henry Cavill himself. This plush is available for a limited time only. So if you want your own little Wiz to stand or sit on your desk, then check the link in the description below. Now on to the actual video. In the process of Dynamic Pixels being acquired by Tiny Build, it went through a bit of a transformation and was rebranded to Eerie Guest Studios. Some of those who were originally working at Dynamic Pixels stuck around, and now Tiny Build had another studio to help with the production of games for this growing franchise. Like Hello Neighbor Hide and Seek, the prequel to the original, initially released on the 6th of December 2018. That was, to be fair, positively received by fans. It was made at the time where Dynamic Pixels was still dynamic pixels, so it does share some of these same quality control issues, but it's not as bad as Hello Neighbor. But in this game, the AI is your brother and you, you just gotta run from him. No sneaking around a house, no breaking into a basement, it's all about finding stuff and exploring the backstory to the neighbor through the eyes of his traumatized children. But then there was Secret Neighbor, released in October 2019, that is still a fairly active multiplayer game where you get to play as one of six kids trying to get into the neighbor's basement. But here's the catch, one of them is secretly a neighbor. Of course with this being a multiplayer game you can get yourself some uh, sweet neighbor swag. And of course there are two currencies, one of them being premium. I'd hate to think how much money people actually spent on this game, but who am I to judge? When I used to think buying armor in Shiv made me look cooler and therefore play better. But this game does contain an event that is actually relevant to this video. There was also this game here, Hello Engineer, which was all about making wacky vehicles and racing with friends. To be fair, it seems like a harmless bit of fun, but it was totally unrelated to what you'd expect from these types of games. It just seemed like they made an entirely different game, but plastered the IP on top of it to make it sell. But it was a Stadia exclusive anyway, so massive L on that front. Although it is coming to Steam, so if you want the Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts we have at home, then there you go. To add to this ever-growing franchise, they also released a cartoon series that's surprisingly self-aware. He never chases me past his property line. <laughs> Weird, huh? a very profitable book series, merchandise including plushies which I'm not allowed to make fun of, a random board game, and other stuff. The viewpoint from Tiny Build when it comes to making this a franchise is to explore other media, and with great success, that's exactly what they did. Tiny Build are well aware of the demographic that largely follow their games. I mean, it's no surprise that it appeals to a typically younger audience, primarily from ages 8 to 16, according to Tiny Build's press release release. And you could say that this is a franchise that fits into a similar vein as Mascot Horror, although I wouldn't personally place it in that subgenre. And of course, there has been a lot of discussion about Mascot Horror recently. It does share a very lucrative audience as a sort of family-friendly horror, which kind of makes this whole situation worse. Because regardless of demographics, quality still matters. And although things have admittedly been better with some of their new releases, Hello Neighbor 2, as we'll soon find out, came with a few big promises that arguably helped to sell this game, but didn't deliver on with a release that felt again rushed. 
Our story with Hello Neighbor 2 actually begins with Secret Neighbor. More precisely, an event that gave the fans what they wanted. A mystery to be solved. It was called the Mayak event. Now bear with me, there is quite a lot to this and an already well made video that goes into detail about it. In the game, players found a pin board with photos that spelt out forward slash HGP. This turned out to be an extension for the secretneighbor.com URL. If you put forward slash HGP at the end of it, then you'd get this big red button that says don't press. Of course people pressed the button and when they did it would download a zip file but to open it you'd need a passcode. Where could people find this passcode? Well around this time a random door appeared on one of the maps with a question mark on the lock. In this game doors like this typically come with numbers and there's always a corresponding key card that goes with it. But of course this was a mystery that had to be solved and people went on the lookout for this key card. Eventually some players noticed that there was a bird flying around the house and that if you shoot it, it drops the secret key card. Using it on the mysterious door leads you into a room with a teleporter and a printer. Now there's no power in this room but there was a wind turbine on the top of the house. So people quickly figured out that they needed to get it going just to power up this teleporter. However to do this you need to cause a storm which is a whole other thing to figure out. But with the power on, players could finally use the teleporter and it led them into a room with nothing much besides a five light combination below this screen. Players quickly found out that in the teleporter room, the printer had five lights and all they had to do was have somebody teleport to the other side, read out the combination and have someone else put it into the printer. Once done, it would print out a four character code, which was required to unlock the zip file. But here's the catch. The code was 80 characters long. So this whole process had to be done 20 times just to gain access. But with the code in hand and the zip file unlocked, you you may wonder what's inside. Well, it's a game called Hello Guest, where you'll find yourself in a rundown theme park as a security guard. There's not really any direction as to what you need to do, but something's following you. This little fella right here, who conveniently runs away when you spot him. The whole objective of this game was to power up a roller coaster ride and every time your shift ends, you're able to go to the store to pick up some fuel in order to power it. The reward for beating this game is that you can actually see what's behind this big wall. And that was pretty much it. Now this whole ARG event lasted for about two weeks with people figuring out and Discord, but after that, it was pretty much radio silence. Little did anybody know that this game was pretty much a pre-alpha for a new game that was in fact called Hello Guest. And it didn't take till the 13th of June 2020 for that to become a reality, as on that day, Alpha 1 for Hello Guest was released. Now, thankfully, you can play this one for free on Steam, so I gave it a go and it was pretty good. In this game, you can pick between two different characters, Quinton or Beard tricks. And you'll find yourself again working the night shift as a security guard in a dilapidated amusement park. After a short cutscene, you'll walk down a path for a little bit and quickly notice that you're holding a map. Following this path, you'll hear a phone ringing in the distance and it seems to be coming from your office. Once you make it inside and answer the phone, your objective is made clear by this checklist that tells you to check the top of the mountain. When you go outside, you'll get another cutscene that shows you something Thing going on up on the mountain. So already the mystery has presented itself, but now you've got to find a way up there. And in true Hello Neighbor fashion, you're going to have to explore and piece things together to actually achieve this objective. For example, you'll notice this building and to get access to it, you're going to need to open up this gate, which requires a key. After looking all over the place, I eventually discovered it in the attic of the office, which actually makes sense because the key would be somewhere somewhere in your office. Or you could just use a fire extinguisher to jump over the fence, either way works. But while you're exploring, you'll also notice that there are a bunch of Hello Neighbor haters kicking the shit out of this already warped amusement park. This makes sense because you're at work and you're meant to do your job, which means you've also got to scare them away and uh, also watch them phase through giant walls. But there is something else out there, something clicking in the distance, who is of course the Birdman, the, the guest. Now, similar to the ARG, he only attacks you when you're not looking, which makes for some decent jump scares. 
Oh my god, he's right there. After every 15 minutes, your shift ends and you make some money. But you can also see that if you don't scare these vandals away, then you'll make less money. Which is pretty cool because you're meant to be just doing your job, but there's a mystery going on that you want to solve. Anyway, at this point, you can go on and continue your shift or you can go to the store. And this is where money is important because in the store, you have a whole bunch of items to choose from that are necessary to making it up to the mountain. When exploring you'll find another building with this long staircase and inside there are these separate rooms and one that is blocked by a generator. This is actually a key item that you need along with cables to power up things such as this machine that combines objects into even more useful ones. For example, somehow I managed to make some springy shoes from a fire extinguisher and fuel. I don't know how, I don't know why, but the sound of these shoes is straight out of Looney Tunes. Anyway, after a while, I figured out that you need to power up this building here with the generator to open the elevator doors within. The first door is a pretty simple timed sequence where you need to flip the switch that corresponds with the light. But the second door is a bit more difficult because it's all the way at the top of the elevator shaft. So with springy shoes and a fire extinguisher, which is basically a jetpack, I managed to propel myself upwards, but at the top, there were also another set of lights. The problem is that the switches are all the way at the bottom and there's no way to complete this in time. However, you can use a camera and stick it up there to see what light turns on and there you go, puzzle solved. Once you make it up through the lift, you find yourself in this room. And there's not really anything here, but there is an opening to jump outside. And when you do, there's another cutscene. So there you go, that was the end of Alpha 1 for Hello Guest. And to be honest, I, I was quite impressed. This felt like a massive step up from what I experienced before. And everything besides the shoes made sense. So it felt good figuring out these puzzles. But this would pretty much be the end of Hello Guest as we know it. Because only a month later, on the 23rd of July, Hello Guest suddenly turned into Hello Neighbor 2. They changed the name on the same day and a new alpha came out along with an official announcement trailer. So if people weren't too sure before, Hello Neighbor 2 was now a thing. And this is where it all starts to get a bit weird because from this point onwards, promises were made, features were shown, but the outcome only left people confused. The Hello Neighbor 2 Alpha 1 has you playing as game journalist Quinton, who's trying to figure out what happened to the simming neighbor. It follows a similar concept where you have a house that you need to break into and you need to find items to access a door. In the intro cutscene, you're given some information as to what you need Need to do and it's just enough to get you started. The inhabitant of this house is the guest and now you're on his property and he will chase you. The best part about this is that when he grabs you he actually drags you away to the front of his house and just throws you with ungodly strength scattering all of your items. I also noticed that in the trailer he trips over stuff and I, honestly I just thought that this was a, a part of the trailer not something you can do in game but when you throw stuff at him he actually does trip over in the most pathetically funny way possible. This really beats throwing something at the neighbor just for him to tank it and slow down for a second. It's, I love it, man. Now, remember when I said Hello Neighbor had these nonsensical convoluted puzzles in the last video? Well, I have to say they've definitely improved a lot when it came to this alpha. For example, the guest has a bedroom with a key item in it, which is the crowbar, but it's locked by some key code. Instead of having to find the key code somewhere in the house or in one of the abandoned buildings, you're given a camera at the start of the game. And if you sneak up onto the top floor, and place the camera pointing at the lock, then eventually you'll see the guest go into his room, but when he does, you get the code. To me, this is promising game design because you're given a tool that you're not too sure what to do with yet, but when you figure it out, it all makes sense. There's none of this find a random object and place it in random location to unlock a code. It's just common sense, and that's what I was looking for in the original. Anyway, 
When you go inside his room, you'll find the crowbar, but there's an issue. You've just pressed some loud buttons and he's probably on his way to get you. So you could run back and risk having your items thrown all over the place, or you can use the crowbar straight away on these planks of wood blocking the window. Again, this is competent game design. They introduce a new item and you're forced to use it straight away. The next challenge is now to find the key and it's in a fireplace that's sometimes on and sometimes off. And to get it, it requires timing and distractions. Fortunately for me, the guest bugged out on my van and I could just walk in and grab the key. But now with the key and the crowbar, I need to find a way to get into the attic. And at first, it doesn't seem too easy to get inside. But when you make it on top of the roof, you'll notice that there's this cable right above the attic door. At first glance, it doesn't really make sense as to why it would be here, but it's actually a hint. Because in this alpha and the alpha before it, you can swing with cables. So to me, it was quite clear that I needed to find a generator so I can swing off of the roof into the attic. At first, it was pretty difficult to find, but after exploring the map, I could hear the noise of a generator near the supermarket. And this is the same supermarket from the last alpha, but this time it's all boarded up and out of service. So eventually I found the generator on the roof and it also came with another cable. I'm pretty sure I was meant to use this generator for something else, but after using the key and painstakingly trying to get these planks of wood off the door, I set up the generator on the roof and swung into the attic, which honestly was a pretty cool experience. Everything besides the guest getting stuck on my van felt like it was rooted in logic at least for this universe. But anyway, inside this room, you'll find a costume. For who, we don't know, but after picking it up, it seems pretty clear because, oh my god, there he is. The neighbor too. So far, this all looks very promising. It feels like they listened to the feedback and just wanted to make a better game. And you can see that they actually put some thought behind the alpha. October 2020 began with an announcement slash reveal of Alpha 1.5, saying that it would be released later that month on the 26th, and it was released on time. Not as a separate game, but as an update to the existing Alpha. Now, Alpha 1.5 is very similar to Alpha 1, but this time it's Halloween themed and the puzzles require a bit more work to figure them out. For example, the crowbar is stuck behind this fence and there's no way to get to it. But you'll notice that next to it, there's a plug socket and a switch. When you use a generator to power whatever this is, you'll see that a conveyor belt below starts moving and it's clear that you need to get the crowbar on that conveyor belt. But how would you make it fall? Well, if you've used a fire extinguisher before, then you'll know that it has the ability to move objects. So if you use it on the crowbar, it will fall onto the conveyor belt and then it will be taken outside. All you have to do after that is just climb up onto the roof and there you go, you've got yourself the crowbar. The next item you need is the key and it can again be found in a furnace. Although this time, it's a bit more challenging because once you get the fire extinguisher, you may think to yourself, oh, I can just put this fire out, no problem. Well, what you'll also notice is that there's a conveyor belt feeding the fire with more junk. But that's not a problem. You can always flip this switch here and reverse it. But the fire is still pretty hot and it takes a while to put it out. And in that precious time that you're trying to put this fire out, you've only got mere moments until this guy shows up and throws you off his property. I mean, he didn't even take me downstairs for this one. He just threw me out the window. So it's clear that this challenge requires a bit more timing and skill. Skill that I don't really have. So I did look up a guide just to see if I was doing the right thing by flipping the switch to reverse the conveyor belt and then trying my hardest to put the fire out. But even though that is the strap, I was missing the distraction, which is an alarm clock that you can throw down here. And with that, you buy yourself just a little bit of time to flip the switch, go back outside, spam the fire extinguisher, jump over to the treehouse because he will get there before you put it out and then jump back to hopefully grab the key in time before he gets you. Now with the key and the crowbar, you can make it up to the attic and in there you'll come to realize that you need to get something else. You need to get some candy for these totally alive abducted children. Now in the last alpha, I didn't mention this so much, but the rest of the map is filled with abandoned buildings, but they were more used as set pieces in that one. In this alpha, they actually serve a purpose and each one have their own little puzzle to get them sweets. So once you've collected a few more and go back to the attic, you can put them in this basket and you'll see that there's a little fella in this room who gets closer each time. And when you place all of them into the basket, everything changes and there he is, the neighbor too, stuck 
screaming for help. There were a couple of pretty cool features in these alphas. For example, when it comes to losing your items, you can either find them by looking for a swarm of crows hovering over them, which is a nicely themed and somewhat subtle cue to help you find lost items. Or if the guest steals items from you, then you can find stuff in his fridge, which on its own doesn't sound that interesting. But the idea of retrieving confiscated items not only adds another layer of challenge, it's also much more creative than your items respawning where they originally were. I love the fact that when you get caught, instead of a repetitive animation and a fade to black, they give you a small chance to fight back when the guest drags you outside. You can actually throw stuff at him and he'll let go. Even when he does throw you outside, it doesn't feel like the game just reset itself. You actually feel like you're relentlessly invading this guy's space. And as a professional home invader, I like that. And of course, again, the ability to trip him up is both fun and rewarding when you land that perfect shot. It might look a bit jank, but it was something that people, including myself, enjoyed. If it wasn't already obvious, I'm bringing up all of these features because, spoilers, they weren't in Hello Neighbor 2. They weren't flat out promises either, but there were a lot of cool things in these alphas that were cut for the full release. Anyway, this would be the last alpha and development on the full game continued. For a while, not too much was heard besides some posts here and there, along with Discord chatter, but their marketing campaign really kicked off in March 2021 with their first big promise. Advanced AI, or more specifically, using a neural network for the neighbor. And they went into a fair amount of detail within this video. When you break into Mr. Peterson's house, you'll be going against an AI that is constantly evolving. Mr. Peterson's behavior is a combination of a neural network and algorithms that allow him to constantly learn from his experiences with everyone who plays our game. It begins with the collection of player activity. Mr. Peterson takes note of player behavior, whether or not most players are likely to hide in a closet, use a certain escape route, or certain objects. How Mr. Peterson plays in one encounter with you might be different from the next, all due to his encounters with the game's community as a whole, allowing for an AI that is developed through community actions, replayability, and great stories of neighborhood shenanigans. This was arguably the largest selling point as it would mean that the game would have more replayability besides just new content and finding secrets. They also go on to say that this wouldn't just be for the neighbor, but also for the other characters within this game. Now, as a fun little tangent, I love watching videos about people teaching AI to play games. And I'm sure you've all seen this video here made by Two Minute Papers, where OpenAI built a hide and seek game with two teams playing against each other. The blue team would hide and the red team would seek. In the beginning, like with most AI, it wasn't that smart, but per round, each team learned how to play and eventually how to play very effectively. For example, the blue team learned how to box themselves in, but then the red team learned how to use a ramp to get over. In response to this, the blue team learned that they could just take the ramp away or, even better, glitch it out of bounds. In another instance, the red team figured out that they could use a ramp to get on top of a box and surf it, which turned out to be an exploit in the game that they were more than capable of figuring out. Now, imagine a much more complex environment and the amount of sessions required by the devs and community to get the neighbor to a playable state. This little hide and seek game took millions of rounds just for the AI to learn the basics. So how would that work in reality for this guy? I'm sure for those interested in AI, you probably have an answer already, but the question I have is, what's the limit? Could the neighbor exploit the game and become some godlike creature? And if so, how would they cap it? It's not hard to imagine with the quality shown in previous games for this to become an issue. I mean, imagine your own mascot exploiting your own game. The amount of resources just to keep on top of it and fix things would be quite a lot to deal with. Now, don't get me wrong. It seems like a cool idea, but already it seems very ambitious and tricky to implement. Anyway, surely the guys over at Eerie Guess would have known this already, and they seem pretty confident in pushing the idea as it was shown multiple times throughout their campaign. So much so that they pushed it pretty hard as a good reason to wishlist the game, because a couple months later on the 15th of May, they told their fans to wishlist the game because the more people who play it, the better the AI. If you've wishlisted Hello Neighbor 2, you'll be one of the first people notified that the game is out and you'll be likely one of the first people to train Mr. Peterson's AI. When you wishlist Hello Neighbor 2, Steam receives information about that game compared to other titles. The higher the wishlist count, the more popular the game is according to Steam. The more people who play the game starting on day one, the more tricks Mr. Peterson learns that will surprise players and make for an entertaining game. So in short, the more wishlists, the more people will see the game and likely join the community. The more people playing the game on launch day, the more entertaining and versatile the neural network AI becomes. So as you heard right there, the whole point is to get more people to play the game on day one so that they can train the AI, which is fair enough because 
you're gonna want the AI to be as good as possible so that on day one, he isn't just walking into a wall and uh, uh, doing whatever he would do. But anyway, we'll come back to this later. Because this now brings us on to the next promise, along with other things that they alluded to. Later in July, they released their first official devlog with more mention of the AI and how it works, but they also go into detail about the world itself. What they said is that this would be a open world sandbox game where you have the main quest line with the neighbor and other side quests with different people. All of course with their own neural network AI. Now they showed about four different people in this video and of course our favorite Birdman who they kind of said would stalk you at night. Not something 100% confirmed but they alluded to that. Now on the 10th of December they announced that the beta and pre-order would be available on the 7th of April 2022. But in this video Video, besides reconfirming that the neighbor would be again using a neural network, the footage itself shows the characters that you may encounter and gameplay of Quinton exploring different places. This footage visually suggests a couple of things. One is that it does look like an open world sandbox game, and the other is that each location is somewhat linked with unique items being taken from one place and used in another. Overall, it gives off the impression that this would be a world full of places to explore and that you can probably go anywhere and and mess with anyone you want at any time. But this is where things get kind of fishy, because on pre-order day, they released another video. Now, this video confirmed a few other things. One is that on this day, people can now, in fact, spend money and pre-order the game. The next thing is that by doing so, you'll get early access and also access to the beta, which they did mention in a previous video. But also, if you want, you can sign up to the Deluxe Edition DLC content, which, don't you worry, we'll take a look at later. But the one thing that wasn't said or reconfirmed in this video was in fact the neural network AI. It could have just been a script error or something they thought people knew about already with the multiple mentions of it before. And when you look at the Steam page at the time, it does say that every character in Hello Neighbor 2 is powered by a neural network AI. So at least we know that upon pre-ordering the game, we can expect this on the full release. On the same day as pre-order, people could get a real taste for this game because on that day, the beta went live. Now I've played the beta and there are quite a few things that we'll see in the full release anyway, so I won't go into this step by step. But there are some positives and negatives that are worth addressing. First is that they hit the mark with a solid tutorial, where you fall into a barn and lose your camera. After getting up, you're immediately presented with a window and a board. Outside the window is a scarecrow and on the board, it tells you to take a picture of it. So so it's made very clear that we need to get our camera back. In the process of retrieving your camera, the game teaches you the mechanics through action. And when you take a picture of the scarecrow, you'll very quickly find that the guest isn't happy and he's trying to break into the barn. But then he runs away, making you think that you have a clear exit, only for him to jump you again and realize that it was all just a dream, similar to the original, and that Quinton almost ended this game before it even started. But this was, as all tutorials should be, straightforward, short, and and intuitive. Speaking of things that are intuitive, similar to Alpha 1 when we're introduced to the crowbar, a key item in this game, we can see whilst inside this basement that a crowbar is hanging off of a plank of wood, and the only way to get out is by using it on the same looking planks of wood nailed to the basement hatch. So again, we're introduced to a key item, and without being told, we already know what it's used for. When it comes to puzzles, we already know that things have improved since the original, but here for example, if it's not in a cutscene, Objectives are made clear through placement, like in the museum where the neighbor's hiding. You've got this locked door, but right next to it, you can see a picture of the mayor holding the key to it. So it's made clear that to find this key, I need to find the mayor. And if you go to his house, you'll see straight away that the key is being held by a statue and guarded by a dog. What they've done is given you a clue, which is enough to figure out where to find the key, but the challenge itself comes through the process of getting it. Another example is when you unlock the museum door and straight away you see this drawing of the neighbor telling this kid to go to the attic. Even though they sometimes use cutscenes to tell you where to go, they didn't need to for this. And when you make it into this room upstairs, you can find a pole required to open the attic door. But you'll find out that you need to get three heads for these three headless statues to unlock it. It wasn't as easy to figure out as I made it seem there, but it made sense and I had an idea as to what I needed to do. So the marker is set, you just need to figure out how to get there. Later on, when you encounter other NPCs, 
the challenge comes through figuring out smaller puzzles while exploring each NPC's behavior, habits, and the environment. Like for example, the taxidermist. You can see from this painting that you need to find him, and when you get to his place, you'll very quickly find some instructions in his post box. These instructions basically show you how to make a fish head, but if you keep an eye on the taxidermist, you'll notice that he'll go to his workbench, make a wooden duck, take it outside, and use it for target practice. If you place these instructions on his workbench, he'll instead make the fish head, but you also need to be quick and grab it before he shoots it. Anyway, in this beta, there were a few things that were cut from the alpha that probably would have made the game a bit better, and also something that wasn't there that raised a bit of a red flag. Like the guest, for example, a key character in the marketing campaign who even has a plush and who we saw in the alphas. He was only seen twice, once in the tutorial and if you go off into the dark on the first level. He just appears out of nowhere to give you a little jump scare and then pushes you back on the right path. But then that's it. No more guest. Speaking of getting caught, when you actually get caught by an NPC, it's just a short cutscene with a fade to black and then you're back outside again. What happened to being dragged around with the chance to free yourself? Maybe it's just me, but that added a whole other level to the chase. Speaking of AI, this was just a spoiler-free playtest, so the full release was probably going to have a different layout anyway. But with all the talk of this neural network AI and needing people to test it, why wasn't it here? I mean, an argument can easily be made as to why, but come to think of it, there wasn't much evidence besides a few videos mentioning it that they weren't actually working on this. So of course, some people already raised their concerns. But with that being said, people didn't have to wait too long to test this AI. Because on the 6th of December, the full game was released, along with the Deluxe Edition DLC and my god, did it go wrong. There's quite a lot to go through here. I mean, for starters, you've got a lot of bugs and unpolished features. But then there are the big promises and the things that were alluded to which weren't in the game and still aren't months later. The first major thing is, of course, the much-promised neural network AI. I know, it's a shock. It's almost like by focusing on it so much in this video, didn't give it away. This, of course, pissed people off because it wasn't just something that was said as a maybe or just some one-off thing that they alluded to. This was a pretty big selling point in the marketing campaign, to the point where even on pre-order day, people could see confirmation that the AI would in fact run on a neural network. Somewhere down the line, it must have been cut, but you'd think that they would mention this at some point, right? Well, no, they didn't. It looked like they had some secret operation to eliminate all mention of the neural network and do it progressively before release. As not long before release day, the description changed. Now, I can't find exactly when they first removed the mention of neural network AI on Steam DB, but it must have been sometime in November as on the 6th it was still mentioned. But here's where it gets worse. An active member from the Discord found that only two days before the pre-order early access that the Steam description changed again, but this time they were caught in the act, showing a change from the neighbor is controlled by an AI that learns from the players, as time passes his behavior will change and surprise you, to just the neighbor is controlled by advanced AIs. The same person who called this out also shared a picture of someone raising concerns in October as to if the neural network was scrapped or not, with the lead game designer at the time Alexis saying, as I previously explained, any neural network is extremely dumb without proper training, and we can't train the AI on just a handful of play sessions from the devs. It's up for the community to make the AI learn from past mistakes. You could assume that from this one response that it would still be in the game, as well as the fact that in October, the Steam description still said that there would be neural network AI. While digging a little bit deeper, I know noticed that the original game designer and creator of Hello Neighbor, Nikita Kolesnikov, who was also the brains behind the alphas of Hello Neighbor 2, was either demoted at some point or stepped down, with Alexis stepping in and making changes. It wasn't until the beta where people realized that quite a lot has changed. Anyway, this user was banned from the Discord for offensive behavior, and I couldn't find any more trace of this conversation. It also looks like Alexis stepped down at some point, and there is only mention of him on Discord, and the things that he re confirmed with the fans. Either way, they promised this feature, got the pre-orders in, and on release day, it wasn't there. No announcement or anything like that. The next lie was with the open world sandbox, where you can do side quests and explore other places. In the beta, you could go around and do the quests in whatever order you want, with the ability to find any of the items you need in whatever order, but not with the full release. Because in this, the town may be open to explore, but the story and progression is linear. 
For example, you could go to the bakery at the very beginning, but it's closed. You could go to the taxidermist, but there's an invisible wall stopping you. You could go to the mayor's mansion, but the gate is closed. And if you look inside the museum, even as of recording, you can see empty rooms with shadows where furniture is meant to be. To access other places, you need to complete each house in order. The only benefit of exploring other places is that you may find secrets and collectibles. So there's none of this main quest line surrounded by subquests, I guess. One other thing that was more so alluded to than promised was the presence of the guest. In the beta, he was reduced to a jump scare and cutscene. In this, he only appears in a cutscene at the beginning of the game. No creeping around at night, no tripping over, no grabbing, no nothing. It might not seem like a big deal, but as mentioned before, he was a big part of the story, and the fans were looking forward to seeing more of him. Even I was, and that's after playing Hello Neighbor 2 before the alphas. Maybe they have bigger plans for him later, but who knows? There was also the mention of a farmer and the possibility of other characters. I can understand why they only had five, including the neighbor, because there's probably a lot that goes behind adding characters, but as a result, it felt lacking in content. Regarding content, the game wasn't even finished upon release, with them leaving everyone on a cliffhanger on the end with this message, saying that they've got big plans and that there'll be future updates. If you follow my second channel, you'll know that I've played my fair share of indie horror games, and it's understandable for a solo or small dev team to release something in early access that's unfinished, with the promise that more will come. But from an already established studio with the help of others, it seems strange that they would release it as is without achieving whatever other milestones they had planned. This is made worse by the fact that the only additional content worth any value came from the day one DLC, which were basically broken with one of them that you couldn't even complete. I mean, we'll see later that even today, there are a lot of issues with the DLC. But I also noticed that Steel Wool Studios, the people behind Security Breach, were on release day included in the developer tags, but for whatever reason have been removed. It's not really clear as to what exactly happened, whether they asked to be removed or Tiny Build removed them because they did such a bad job. It's just really strange to see that you have the people who made stuff like this being removed from the tags on the DLC, when they're also apparently working on this game, a Hello Neighbor VR game. Now there were a few other little things like a weather system and an amusement park that were mentioned or seen at some point but were also not in the game. Anyway, regardless of all of the broken promises, the bugs, the lack of content and the botched DLC, what's my take on the game? Is it really that bad and has it improved since release? Well, I played this game back in February and recorded my experience on a spreadsheet. It's a mess, I know, but what I found at the time was a lack of attention to detail, some bugs here and there and the game crashed when I I beat it. But there's something I need to own up to. I kind of lost the footage. Like, I have no idea where the hell it's gone, and it's not the kind of thing I would intentionally delete. I even went full CIA just to try and recover any missing files, but no. Just like anyone else, I make stupid mistakes. Anyway, going through it a second time, let's take a look at the main elements in this game. As I've mentioned with the two alphas and beta, this game is a big step up from the original. It honestly feels like they've tried to make a decent cat and mouse puzzle game. Game. Each location has a set objective and multiple mini puzzles to get key items. Most of the time you'll get a clue or with a bit of exploration and messing around, you'll eventually figure things out. This time, everything seemed to link together. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were some weird puzzles and some objects that were so well hidden you wouldn't think that they were actually an item that you need. But at least compared to the original, everything makes a lot more sense. For example, these number blocks you'll find on the first level. At first, you'll have no idea what they're meant for, but then you'll find a room with a safe in it that requires a code. You'll also notice that next to it are some coloured flags, and the number blocks are also coloured. Put two and two together, and you'll realise that if you find all four blocks, you can figure out the code to the safe and get one of the keys to unlock the basement. Another example is with the baker. In her bedroom, you'll eventually find this hour hand for a clock. When you look about, you'll notice that it's meant for this clock, and when you place it, nothing happens. At first I had no idea what was going on, but then I realised that there are a few digital clocks placed around. I also noticed that the time never changes, and they were set to 10.35. So if you match that on this one, you'll get one of the buttons that you need for the register to get a key. But there were some puzzles that didn't make sense because they're kind of stupid. For example, you need to get some scissors to cut things, right? It's a very key item to have, and you can find one in a treehouse. But even though the scissors are right here, with 
with nothing blocking your way to actually pick it up, you need to solve a puzzle to get this train to bring it to you. There was also this piece of a picture behind some hazard tape, and I mean, the tape's not even over it, you, you could just lean across and grab it, you don't need scissors to get this. Another example could be found back at the bakery. There's this bush that contains one of the keys for the cash register, but it's, it's just in a bush. And instead of just being able to pick it from the bush, you need to turn the water off, cut the bush, and there you go, it's, it's, it's levitating and now you can grab it. What I'm trying to say is, is that although the puzzles themselves make sense, some of the obstacles don't. Now, to be fair, there was a good mix of different puzzles with their own set of challenges, but there were quite a few common themes just with their own slight variation. The world design and graphics in this game is much better, but I did notice some bits here and there that show a lack of attention to detail, even more so in my first playthrough, but even playing it now, there are a few things here and there. Like for example, why is this box flickering when I get closer? Why is this box floating? Why is Quinton shoving his key into the dashboard? Why am I stuck in the bakery door? Why is the baker kneading invisible dough? Why can't I pick up this fire extinguisher from behind a locked case? In fact, why is my fire extinguisher enlarged after beating the game? And of course, more importantly, what happened to the glass? When you smash glass in this game, it just evaporates. Even the original had better glass effects. Now, I know I'm being pedantic, and it's much better than it was before, but this is just a reminder that it's the little things like this that can make a game seem rushed, even though this game was apparently in development for about five years. Anyway, the AI may not be using a neural network, but what's it like without it? Well, first off, it's very similar to the beta. The AI essentially has a few paths, and those paths seem to change when you're in different locations. And they're not too challenging either. You can just hide under stuff and they'll forget you're there. Or stand in a corner oblivious to anything that's going on. I mean, this in particular didn't happen all the time, but when it did, it made things pretty easy. Now, in the original, the neighbor would lay traps and sort of adapt to your habits. However, I didn't notice this here. He only seemed to lay traps on the last level, and it also appeared to be at random. Either way, in my humble opinion, the saddest thing with the AI was the lost potential with the features that I've, again, mentioned before, with the grabbing and tripping over. In the alpha, there was context. You could see yourself getting thrown out, with a chance to save yourself. Similar to the beta, they went back to basics, with this cut to black, and then you're outside again. I would have rated this higher if they explored those features in more detail, but I can understand why they probably removed them. Maybe they weren't optimized and it would have just added another layer of testing, but I think it would have made the AI at least more fun to mess with. We already know that from launch there wasn't that much content in the game, and there hasn't really been anything else added to it since then. But on my first playthrough, it didn't feel too bad. I mean, there were some nutty speedruns showing off a bunch of exploits and some more seasoned players could finish the game anywhere between 4-6 to six hours, but for the price it's going for, you can definitely find something else with more content. But in all honesty, this is subjective. It really does depend on the person playing it and their familiarity with games like this. Now, they did post a 2023 roadmap where they say that they're going to improve the AI with new features, expand the neighborhood with new unique characters, have more complex investigations, add more lore exploration, upgrade the existing world with new puzzles, secrets, and Easter eggs, at some point add some new locations, as well as some quality of life changes. They didn't give any dates for this additional content, so I guess we're gonna have to see sometime this year. I think that overall, this isn't a terrible game. It's not perfect by any means, but I think they've come a long way since the original. I think that if they didn't make those big promises and this was meant to be the final outcome, then they would have hit the mark if they released it a bit later after polishing up some bits. But then of course there are the DLCs. Now there are two of which that actually provide new content. The other one is just this helicopter which you can use as a drone. I gave both DLCs a go and even to this day th there are a lot of bugs. The AI kept opening the same door over and over again. There was this awkward moment where I was in the corner and he was just standing there with his nose going through my screen. Another moment where I was stuck in a cupboard with his dog just staring at me and uh, him trying to open the door. I was so stuck that I couldn't even open up the menu. So I got my drone just to see what was happening on the other side and it, it made for quite a weird looking moment. There are also quite a few times where the game crashed. For some reason, hiding next to desks uh, would crash my game. One time with the dog staring at me and another time literally doing nothing, just crouching behind a desk. 
Speaking of crashing, the physics in this DLC is very different to the main game. And I first noticed this by placing down a box that I had and it making this really odd sound. After kicking the box around for a little bit, the game also crashed. The level design and puzzles themselves weren't all too bad. It's quite a big level, so it's easy to get lost. But you see, there's this flagpole and you need to find the handle to raise the flag so that you can get a key. I found the handle, I placed it on the flagpole and I raised the flag, which gave me said key. When I was looking around to see where I could use the key, I got caught by one of the dogs and the item reset back to the pole, but instead of being down here, it, it was up here just menacingly floating there. And because the game thinks that I've already done the puzzle, I couldn't get the key down. I tried to fix this by loading the save and also closing and opening the game, but it became very clear that I had to restart the whole thing. The next DLC is the one that people literally couldn't complete on day one. But as of recording, there are still a lot of issues. Firstly, there was this really poor attention to detail. You could see window frames weren't even attached to the wall. Some of the books were floating. This ladder just teleports you up to the top. And at the top, there's this gap on the roof, but they forgot to patch it up so you can just see through the building. Speaking of gaps, they didn't patch this one. I managed to fall off the stairs and get stuck behind some bookcases, which, uh, which is always nice. I found multiple cases of terrain just overlapping or cutting through things that it shouldn't. And when it comes to the bugs, the main bug I found was with the AI. For some reason, this woman really liked my drone and would just follow it. So I could herd her into this corner. Even when she was meant to be chasing me, and you can see here that she almost got me, but then went back to the drone. I actually played around with this a little bit, because with the drone, you can actually pick up items. And for some reason, I managed to detach this valve that I'm not meant to. I found that I could kind of make her levitate a little bit. But by doing this, I could see inside her hair. So if you wanted to know what she looks like without hair, there you go. The challenge with this one largely comes down to parkour. I mean, the idea is that the NPC won't go after you unless you run or jump or make any noise. So it does kind of make sense, but for the life of me, I just couldn't jump from these fans. When you jump close to a ledge, you can pull yourself up, but with the fans, apparently not. And in the process of climbing in places, I managed to find two lamps merged together. It's almost as if they duplicated the asset, accidentally turned it, and then just forgot about it. Even to this day, I wouldn't really recommend these for the price they're going for. And it's no surprise that Steel Wall Studios were removed from the developer tags. I can't say for sure, but it's more than likely Tiny Build don't want people thinking that this game is going to be bad because of the DLC these guys worked on. And to be fair, it's not like the whole studio worked on the DLC anyway. But we're, we're just going to have to see how this turns out. Now, unfortunately, there is a bit of an elephant in the room. And it's something that I can't really confirm if it had a significant impact on development or not, or if it contributed to the issues. But it is something to consider, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't address it. Tiny Build is a global company with many resources, many studios, and many employees dotted all over the world, including, of course, Ukraine and also Russia. If you're not oblivious to what's going on in the world today, you may notice that this could be a bit of an issue. I bring this up because in my research, I found this interview with less than a thousand views by Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, where Trent Custers and the CEO of Tiny Build, Alex Nichepacek, discussed the struggles through this time. To be very clear, this wasn't specifically about Hello Neighbor 2. It was released before it came out and there were no excuses made. This was about a company coming together and adapting to a life-threatening circumstance. To his credit, Alex mentioned that he sat on calls with the team discussing what might happen and when it did, without any hesitation, put their people first. In a short period of time, they moved as much of their Ukrainian workforce as they could to the other side of the country, with people who have never met in person coming together through such a chaotic time. But of course, there was also the issue with Russia. With many people fleeing before conscription, the company had to act fast and get people out of the country as soon as possible. There was nothing political about this. It was all about making sure that their people and their families was safe. And for that, I have a lot of respect. And with a very high stress situation placed on the heads of those who just want to do what they're passionate about, I wouldn't be surprised if development was affected for not just Hello Neighbor 2, but for the other games that they're working on. Again, it's difficult to confirm how much of an impact this had, but I wouldn't be surprised if it had a part to play. This is just a very unfortunate part of reality right now, and honestly, I hope those who are affected 
are okay. But with that being said, whether you like Hello Neighbor or not, the fans still deserved better than this. They sold this game with a big promise, silently went back on it, and delivered a half-baked product with uncooked DLC. I can't help but think that if they were just upfront and honest about the linear progression, the fact that there wouldn't be any neural network AI, that this would be a very different game to what people were expecting, and also delay the project just to patch things up, then I honestly think things would have turned out a bit better. Because as I've said before, this game is a massive step up from the original. But I wouldn't be surprised if the people who were burnt by this mistrust the next release. However, I've got a feeling that this franchise is probably not going to slow down anytime soon. Tiny Build has and will continue to milk it. They know that a large portion of their target audience are young and less critical than your average black build 18 and above year olds. But it's not like their core fan base didn't notice either. It does feel like with these types of games that there's this idea that they can get away with it. And with this, they kind of have. But even at some point when this franchise does come to an end, there'll always be something else. Thank you so much for watching and apologies for this being so late. It's just me making these vids and goddamn, they are a lot of work. If you want to support the channel and get something throwable in return, then by all means, go get yourself a little whiz. It's good quality and with it, I can finally chill on your desk. Of course, a massive thanks to all of my wicked patrons. All your support has brought the second channel to life and I can't thank you enough. But of course, a big shout out to all of my wicked slayers and cyber wizards. Gibbles by the dozen, time whiz, Nick Waller here to tell you to pre-order that plushie so Wiz can stand on all of your belongings. The Cuddly Bot, Camille B, Sprunkly, Negadan, The One With Severed Toes, Bucky O'Hare, Rare Alex, Basto, Finra, Alex Capral, Lin Kerr, Mr. Pine, Spooky, Artistical, Rosal Bugatti, King Swing, Distant Reality, The Gay Yana, Drager Funyun, Alex Nibs, Arcadius, Dr. Damien Rompapus, Adam, and Borky. I'll see you in the next one, where we actually look at a game that didn't go wrong.